how SN15 performed in its maiden flight. How long do we need to wait before SN16's flight? Why the HLS program was suspended? I'll answer this and many other questions in this episode of Starship Updates. I've planned to say that unfortunately because of the bad weather, the SM15 will fly on Friday, but it turns out that SpaceX surprised us again. On the 5th of May, at about half past 4 UTC, Starship underwent an ambient pressure test, where it was filled with nitrogen. Next, about 5 pm UTC, both forward flaps were untied, so that half hour later the prototype was ready for flaps test. A few minutes after 6 pm UTC, the flight termination system was armed. You can determine whether it's armed or not by checking if they're removed before flight safety pin was removed or not. About half 9 pm UTC, the last SpaceX worker left the test facility, but an hour later a few SpaceX cars were going in the test pad direction again. We were worried that we might have a scrap, but fortunately 10 minutes before 9 pm UTC, the pad was clear again. At this point, all normal procedures have started. First, we've had an activity from the Uri condenser. Then, we've had the tank farm activity followed by the process of fueling the prototype. 5 minutes before the flight, the official SpaceX transmission started and the Raptors were ignited 25 minutes after 10 pm UTC. This time, we could clearly see that the video setup was way better. The stream itself was in 4K. In the first seconds of flight, we've already had a really interesting shot. The camera was able to capture just how hot gets the ground during the engine ignition. In this shot, we could also spot the test nose cone, but I'll talk about it more later. This recording was shot from the camera located in the prototype's forward flap. Unfortunately, 20 seconds after liftoff, the prototype disappeared in thick clouds. The scared camera was able to capture all three Raptors with an enormous amount of detail. This time we haven't had any onboard fires or leak. The engine's plump suggested that this time we've had an almost perfect methane to LOX ratio. As a quick reminder, during the SN8 flight, the engines experienced what's called an oxygen-rich combustion, which basically means that there was too much oxygen in the fuel ratio. This, combined with the Raptor's bell being made partially from copper, resulted in this green flame. On the other hand, we've had the SN10 flight, where there was a fuel-rich situation, meaning that there was too much methane which resulted in the brownish flame color. About a minute after the liftoff, the prototype was at an altitude of 2 kilometers. 30 seconds later, we've had an issue. Not with the prototype, but with the onboard camera signal. Unfortunately, the poor signal resulted in a lot of frozen frames, which means that from now on we need to base our analysis on what John Innsbrucker says. Two minutes after liftoff, we've had the first engine shutdown. It was intentional, but it was a few seconds earlier than in the previous prototypes, though it's possible that John gave this information too early. At T plus 2 minutes 40 seconds, the Starship was at an altitude of 8 km. 50 seconds later, the prototype reached an apogee of 10 km and the second engine shutdown was confirmed. At T plus 4 minutes, we've got the video signal back just right in time for the belly flop maneuver. What's interesting is that it was 20 seconds aerial than usual. They've also accidentally leaked their local UDP server IP, which was used to stream the footage. Unfortunately, it's a local IP address, so there is no way to receive any additional data. For a few seconds, we were fortunate enough to look at the beautiful views from the forward flap camera. John Innsbrucker said that the plan is to light all three engines for the landing flip. Next, we would have one engine shutdown, which should result in a soft touchdown using only two engines. In reality, only two engines lit up for the landing flip, but it was still able to change its orientation, and we indeed had a soft touchdown. There was a small fire after the landing, but according to SpaceX and the disclosed source, this was normal and it was expected. We're not sure whether it was trapped gases, an open valve, or maybe a small leak, but what's important is that after the stream, the fire put out itself. SpaceX should invest in more firefighting equipment. In the next few hours, the prototype was slowly detanked and the workers were able to save the vehicle and get it ready for the transport way faster than during the SN5 or SN6 area. The flight went almost perfect. The only two things that make me worried are first, one of the Raptors wasn't used during the landing flip, which suggests that something might have gone wrong and the onboard computer decided that it's best not to relight this engine. This theory is supported by the video evidence, which shows that indeed, this Raptor's TVC system moved it away from the rest of the engines. The second one is obviously the fire after the landing. You can say that it was expected and stuff, but the reality is that onboard fire is never good and we know how it can end. But hopefully the next prototype revision might help mitigate this issue. 
Oh yeah, and one of the heat tiles appeared to fall off, but this isn't too much of an issue. What's next with SN15? Well, I wanted to say that it will probably be taken to the production facility, where they will disassemble it to analyze the parts in the search of the potential weak points after the landing, they could also send the raptors back to McGregor for more tortures, and all of this would then get scrapped, but it looks like Elon might have a different plan. In his recent tweet he said that they might try to send it into the air again for the second time, which sounds absolutely crazy. Let's hope that it will stick the landing to then become a historic monument. Before we continue, I would love if you could subscribe to my channel so you won't miss out on any of the newest Starship news. As you can see, a huge portion of you isn't subscribed to my channel. Our goal is to reach a thousand subscribers before the end of this month. So don't forget to smash this red shiny button. As you are there, then don't forget to drop a like if you've liked this video. Okay, okay, end of self-promotion, let's get back to the video. Now, let's take a closer look at the SN16 prototype. As you can see, it's almost ready for a rollout. The day after SN15 landing, the aft gloves were mounted. The only thing missing right now is the aerodynamic flap covers and the prototype will be 100% finished. On the RGV Real Photography Discord server, there was a supposed SpaceX employee who said that the SN16 flight should occur in the next two weeks and that they'll work on a video signal quality. We need to remember that the FAA stated that if SN15 lands properly, the SN16 flight will be automatically approved. So I do indeed think that this date is realistic, but take it with a grain of salt because as far as I know it's not confirmed that this person is a SpaceX worker. Next, Mary the Boca Chica girl spotted the bottom section of the SN17 nose cone which was fully covered with heat tiles. It will be the next starship with a record-breaking number of protective tiles. I really can't wait for the rollout of this thing. Next up, another ground service equipment tank was finished. GSC-3 will probably be transported to the orbital GSC farm sometime next week. As a reminder, there will be from 6 to 8 those tanks and their purpose is to hold huge amounts of nitrogen, oxygen and methane needed for the super heavy testing. They will also be covered with GSE shells that are being painted right now in the production facility. Lately, a few interesting things were delivered to Boca Chica. The first one was the Raptor engine with serial number 55, which is the new generation, hopefully reliable Raptor. What's interesting is that it appears that the delivery truck visited the production facility again, but no one was able to spot if and what Raptor was delivered. What's even more interesting is the new thrust pack which was delivered on the 4th of May. There wouldn't be anything special about it except that it has an additional pipe. We're not sure what's the purpose of this thing, but my guess would be fuel connection for the Vacuum Raptor engine. What do you think? Leave your opinion in the comments. When it comes to Super Heavy, it looks like the workspace has slowed down quite a bit. A lot of new parts appeared for BN3, but I have a feeling that BN2 will be skipped entirely. The B2.1 test tank I, which I've talked about in the previous episode may be pressure tested, but I'm worried that BN2 is really close to being scrapped. It would be a really interesting move, especially that BN3 is supposed to be the booster that will carry the SN20 into orbit. In theory, all of this should happen before July the 1st, but I'm pretty confident that they won't be able to stick the deadline. You know, a classic example of Elon time. Unfortunately, Super Heavy won't be able to fly without proper infrastructure, so let's take a look at the orbital launch pad. As always, the pace of progress is unbelievable. From last week, the launch tower received a few more parts, which completed the first tower stage. The two next sections are almost finished and they are waiting in the production facility to be later stacked on top of the construction. Additionally, it looks like the metal support structure for the orbital launch pad pillars was removed. Now, all we need is the launch table on top and the sound suppression system to suppress the acoustic energy generated by 28 Raptor engines. The debris barrier which will protect the orbital launch pad from mishaps during the prototype testing is rapidly growing. Hopefully, it will never be used. Remember when I've said that the GAO protest field by Dynetics and Blue Origin regarding SpaceX's lander can cause the program to be suspended? Well, that's exactly what happened. Dynetics released an additional statement where they've said that SpaceX shouldn't be chosen because, wait for it, their prototype exploded. That's probably the last resort for them and I hope that Dynetics engineers knows how does prototyping works. Whether they know this or not, NASA suspended the funding, but knowing SpaceX they won't stop developing their HLS solution and they will land on the moon with or without NASA. From the less significant news, we have a picture of one of the two SpaceX's robodogs. This one is called Apollo and it's the Zeus's brother. As you can see, he might have been partying too hard as he wasn't able to go to his doghouse on his own legs. In this photo, we have the whole squad, which consists of two robodogs and one drone. It looks like SpaceX is preparing a sick video. 
there wasn't any Starship update event in a long time, so maybe there is one coming. Next up, NASA Spaceflight informed that the test Nosecon underwent tests in the Max-Q simulator, which either resulted in a success or they were halted because, as you can see, the Nosecon has no damage. That's all I've got for you in this video. If you have liked this video, then don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe. Also, check out our amazing Discord server. I'll see you in the next episode of Starship Updates. Bye.